Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? We are in an old courtroom, which is appropriate because our featured poet, Martina Spada, used to be a, a tenant lawyer. I don't know if you knew that, so he said he feels right at home here. I feel very uneasy uh, because my parents wanted me to go to law school and I became a poet instead. I mean, who would do that? As, as did he. <laughs> well, he was probably already a poet. Uh, but welcome to the uh, reading by Martina Spada, and we are going to begin uh, with a sort of award ceremony before the reading featuring the winners of our Donald Hall Poetry Prize, uh, which is now, I believe, in its third year, if that's correct, or the fourth, maybe? Fourth year, yeah. Um, we have three prize winners, uh, first, second, and third, and we also have a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the prize. Um, we had a lot of entries this year, I think almost 50 entries, which is a lot of, uh, I think almost double what we've had in the past. Speaks to our growing creative writing scene, if we can call it that. Uh, I know John Hammer is the hipster of that scene, uh, and, and, and his dark metal persona is trying to spread the scene as much as possible. But uh, we're, we've been growing this uh, over the last five or six years, Ken first and then after I got here. Uh, growing the poetry side even more. So we're excited to see so many poets uh, entering this contest. If you have not entered the contest and are not graduating, we encourage you to enter this contest because uh, every year we can think of students that we have who've written great things, uh, both for our poetry prize and our fiction prize, who do not enter, probably just because you forgot. And as I was telling my 201 students today, there is cash money in these contests, which you can obtain with simple creative writing talent. Uh, I'm looking at some of you who <laughs> are looking at me like, why would I do that? Uh, but it's not all about eternal glory of the word. Uh, it's also about what you can buy your friends at the bar if you win. <laughs> one of these contests. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, um, it was very difficult to judge the contest this year. We had many uh, competitive entries. We actually met for almost an hour and a half uh, deliberating in my office, uh, fighting each other, breaking out shivs, threatening each other with hostile words. We had, I think, 10 finalists. It was very difficult to narrow them down, even to five. Um, so those uh, who, who did win and place in this contest uh, should be congratulated because it was very difficult to do that. So we are going to hear from them in a moment. I'm going to introduce uh, the first two honorable mention award winners, then the third and second prize winner, and then the first prize winner as well. Each of them will read uh, one of their poems, and then the first place winner will read all three of her poems. So our first reader is uh, one of my students currently, Kevin Pollard who is taking my advanced poetry workshop. Uh, he, apparently he wrote poems for Ken Cormier. It's, it's amazing when people write poems outside of my class. I'm always amazed by that. But Kevin turned in a very amusing poem uh, that was a sonnet. Not only was it in iambic pentameter, which already earns me, or earns it, a lot of points on my scoreboard, it also rhymed and was witty and was not written in Shakespearean language. Uh, it was written in a colloquial voice and was about a uh, contemporary scene, and I'm not going to say any more, so please welcome Kevin Pollard. All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, this poem was written about something that uh, you guys probably know nothing about. It's about alcohol, um, and it's called Poison Nectar. The world is spinning as I downed the shot of whiskey that was not supposed to be for me. My friends had been drinking a lot to celebrate for Joe, who is now free of tyranny, or in other words, his ex. The room seems to be moving up and down with each hit from the music. Maybe next time Sarah cheats on Joe, we can just drown ourselves with booze at home instead of this. Wait, I think she just walked in the room. Did Joe really just lean in for a kiss? Well, there it is. The kid just sealed his doom. She's inside him deeper than a scar. The wedding better have an open bar. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Good rhyming couplet at the end. Very difficult, very difficult to pull off, uh, as I'm sure Mar Marty knows. Uh, our next winner is uh, Kyle Lang, another honorable mention who uh, 
uh, aside from being Asian, is someone I identify with <laughs> uh, based on the subject matter of this poem, which uh, is a very touching poem about, uh, uh, really in some ways, like, uh, how do I want to put this? Like, solidarity, if you might say. And I won't say anything more about that than let's just hear Kyle's poem. Give it up for Kyle. Hi, so my poem is titled Ode to the Girl in the Calf, and I swear I didn't know that it was a prompt in Ku's advanced writing course. I wrote this last fall after the Aristotle Oscar May reading. She said that any writers who haven't written a poem about, uh, or haven't written an ode poem yet should write one, and so I was pretty new to poetry at the time, and I was like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. So this is Ode to the Girl in the Calf. To the girl in the calf talking loudly in her phone, this is an ode to you. To the girl in the calf speaking her own language without regard of what others think, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for ignoring the judgmental stares, the sighs of intolerance, the chuckles and whispers from nearby tables. I want to thank you for not noticing your so-called friend who sat beside you looking embarrassed to no end. I don't know what language you speak, whether it's Tagalog, Korean, or some dialect of Chinese. But I wanted to say that your words wrap my, the words you spoke wrapped my heart with your pride and made me reimagine the context behind my two slanted eyes. To the girl in the calf, this is an ode to you. It pains me I don't know who you are or what language you spoke. But if there's anything you should be told, please let it be that no one can take this phone call away from you. Not the students of this school, not the unimpressive demographic of people on this floor, not the arrogant glare of some uncultured ass, not even me, who may seem as assimilated as the rest. To the girl in the calf talking loudly in her phone, don't let this world break the language that you hold so dearly on and don't let your precious upbringing ever escape you. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, if you remember that reading by Aracelis, she was, uh, I think she said that uh, everyone should write an ode to something that was taken away from them, if you remember that. It was an amazing moment as we lose the cable. Uh, but uh, that's exciting. That so you did you write that after the reading, yeah. just on your own? Yeah, I like it when students write poems on their own. What a concept! <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so, thank you, Kyle. Uh, our next reader is uh, the third prize winner. Uh, I'm trying to remember the order now. Uh, Michael, is it Piter? Pitre. It's much more sophisticated than Piter. Uh, Michael has a a great poem he's going to read about the number four. So if you were interested in the number four, you came to the right place. Give it up for Michael. So my poem's also an ode. An ode to the number four. Number four, you perfect little number you, counting your own letters you do. Even in quad, you're clever, but never odd. In poetry, you make your presence known. A quatrain is a stanza with just four lines, perhaps a full poem, typically having one with alternate rhymes. Although you are the smallest composite, you sure do get around. I did not say round, everyone knows you are the square. However, even a circle divided by four makes four right angles, four quadrants, and so you, number four, are no ordinary number, but much more. You are the years in a presidential term, the number of moon phases, the four winds. On the, sail on the horizon, a distant sailboat, the amount of horn conciertos Mozart wrote. You give us direction with four cardinal points, we'd be lost without you. You keep common time in the world of music, shift four is money, yet, money, yet many abuse it. You shape our world, you really do. In July, you tell us to celebrate our independence. DNA has four nucleotides. We can trace our descendants. A hand on a hip or an overhanging top lip. If you're lucky, the leaves on a clover, the number of seasons when a full year is over. How many of you knew that Mozart had four horn concertos? 
not many. I can see all of the very serious professors in the room over there. They're like, we know. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. um, good. Our second prize winner is Stephen Crom. Uh, where is Stephen? Also one of my students from last year. Last year's advanced poetry class has graduated to great success, clearly. Uh, Stephen comes from a high school which has apparently monopolized this prize over the last few years. <laughs> he has joined a long line of many other poets who have gone on to win uh, money in the Donna Hall Poetry Prize. Uh, and he has got a lively imagination, great linguistic skill, uh, always trying something different in poems, which is exciting to me. Uh, so please give it up for Stephen. My poem's about drugs, but um, that's not why I wasn't in senior sem this morning, Professor Cormier, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just visiting for rock and rolling papers. Picture-framed girls leave pink lipstick stains on pickup truck boys repping cigarette brawn. I forget the soft pain left by piano keys, breathing in exhaust pipes with lost cause. I stop to look at the dark crop circles under my brown eyes, longing for the wrong sort of kiss. Bronze lips wither and split. Bong hits leave bruises. It's back, this new breed, black and blue, nicknamed lucid dream. Weeds grow in between my toes and up my thighs. I come home to remind myself that I don't have to. Only the crack nose glass in the purest sense. I broke the mold they set. Cold winters drove me out and into the world. I go west with petals pressed, hurling myself into darkness, meddling with metal things, stepping on rows of rose petals. My testing the edge of a knife with one finger while resting another on the final white key, the high C upsets the lucid dream. I forget the music and let the raw sound of a small town linger. Very dramatic ending use of the microphone. Well done, Stephen, and good shirt. <laughs> He's a free spirit. <laughs> um, our first prize winner is Jen Fremd, who uh, wrote a really striking sequence of poems. Uh, you don't always, always see this in contests. Usually we, we get three or five poems, uh, each individual. Uh, Jen submitted three uh, very Jackson Pollock-like, three untitled poems that we're all working together, and that was what immediately struck me. Uh, but the voice of the poems, uh, which was so probing and, and interesting and dark and dramatic and in writing about this relationship with, a, with an older sister, uh, was very memorable. So please give it up for Jen Fremd. I feel really out of place because I've never written an ode or anything structured, so this is very unusual. Um, I'm also really bad with microphones, so I'm sorry if I yell into this. All right, so these are three poems from a small series I'm writing called Big Sister, We Are Small, and there's only three poems in it so far, so here we are. One. She's older than me by 13 months. Looking at us now, you would reverse the order of our births, for I am height and confidence, booming thunder at a safe distance, and she is small and quiet, empty cup rattling against cell wall confinement. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. Things never turn out the way you think they will. We are like paper doll twins. She raises her left hand and mirrored, I raise my right. Skin deep similarity with equal and opposite realities, Bex exampled with tragedy. To cope, I consumed reaching out hungry hands to take in everything that might sate my need to escape. To cope, she consumed reaching in hungry hands to hollow out her being so her cage can match her feelings. She raised her left hand and mirrored, I raise my right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Sorry. Uh, number two. 
We grew up in Washington, the mountainous side. She taught me a lot about the mountains. For example, much like the mountains, the body is not made with an easy access port. So much like mountains, one must make one if they want in. At night sometimes, I'd watch razor blades picking away remains of the past, thought, past day's thoughts from the fleshy teeth of her arms. She said she felt her mind choking. She said maybe it's anemia, the oxygen just wasn't flowing. She said it's just a self-dosing, knowing she needed iron to keep her going. She said, much like mining mountains, the ore is hidden in veins. So much like mining mountains, one must dig for them. So she did. Three, ever since I learned how to walk, I followed in her footsteps. We are like paper doll twins. She raises her left hand and mirrored. I raise my right. Like I said, we grew up with a lot of mountains, so we learned a lot from the mountains. For example, in 1980, Mount St. Helens tried to commit suicide but didn't make it. The attempt left her face massively scarred. She's now known to be recognizably unrecognizable. That happened in 1980. That happened in the past. That happened and Helen can't just move past that. We grew up with a lot of mountains, so we learned a lot from the mountains. For example, people are a lot like mountains. There is a mountain range in our brains. Our thoughts travel the small mountain paths, but if a large enough rock cracks off, it falls and stops the flow of thought because it can be hard to move past. It can be hard to move on. It can be hard to move these mental scars from what is to what was. And let me say, there must have been a massive earthquake. No wonder she can't seem to think straight. Her brain's pathways seem to be pretty unsurpassable. She is Mount St. Helens, and I'm just Mount Rainier, episodically active, waiting to blow, waiting to be recognizably unrecognizable. We are paper doll twins cut from the same sheet, equal and opposite, and I fear we're just two repeats. She's no longer the person I grew up with, but then again, neither am I. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jen. Uh, let's give all of our readers one more round of applause. And now, our feature performance. <laughs> I just wanted to use that voice. Uh, we're thrilled to have Martina Spada in the room with us today. Called by Sandra Cisneros, the Pablo Neruda of North American poets, Martina Spada was born in Brooklyn in 1957. He has published almost 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His collections of poems include The Republic of Poetry, published by Norton in 2006, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and Alabanza, published in 2003, the title poem of which, about 9-11, has been widely anthologized and performed. His honors include the Shelley Memorial Award, the Robert Creeley Award, the National Hispanic Cultural Center Literary Award, an American Book Award, the Penn Revson Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His book of essays, Zapata's Disciple, published in 1998, was banned in Tucson as part of the Mexican-American Studies program outlawed by the state of Arizona. A former tenant lawyer in Greater Boston's Latino community, Espada is currently a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His newest collection, Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, published this year, is anchored by two beautiful elegiac sequences, one for those who gave their lives to the Patterson Silk Strike in 1913, whose demands led to the creation of the eight-hour workday, and the other for his father, Frank Espada, an extraordinary community organizer, civil rights activist, and documentary photographer who was once jailed in Biloxi, Mississippi for refusing to sit at the back of a bus, and in December 1964, spoke at a rally in Brooklyn for community control of schools with Malcolm X, later taking a photograph of Malcolm taking questions after the rally that became famous. Espada, like his patron saint Whitman, is a poet of the people, a fierce champion of those whom Whitman called the numberless unknown heroes equal to the greatest heroes known such as the poet Jose Jogo Uvea and the Puerto Rican boxer Jose Chegui Torres, as well as victims of cruelty and injustice, such as Jim Foley, a former student of his, the journalist beheaded on video by ISIS, Trayvon Martin, the unarmed black teenager murdered by George Zimmerman, and the children educators killed at Sandy Hook Elementary. Espada also champions other champions of the people, such as the great journalist John Reed, who covered the Patterson Silk Strike and the Bolshevik Revolution, and historian Howard Zinn, his friend, 
author of the landmark People's History of the United States. There is no storyteller like a storyteller with a broken nose, he says in one poem, announcing the hidden power of words held by those who were battered by those with more apparent power. The man with this hidden power, quote, will live forever, as he says of Jose Gouveia, dying of cancer but still shouting his ode to evil Knievel in biker bars, and his father, who would die then live, living, of course, most memorably through the words of his son, the poet Martin Espada, who is with us here tonight. Please give him a warm welcome. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Much better. Oh, thank you very much. First of all, um, I want to thank Jason Koo for everything he's done um, to organize this event and for everything he's doing on behalf of poetry, both here um, at uh, Quinnipiac University and uh, also in Brooklyn through Brooklyn Poets. Um, we need uh, organizers like everybody else, every other uh, class of worker needs to organize, so do poets. So please give Jason Koo a hand. And uh, I want to also indicate my uh, appreciation and my admiration for the, the student poets who just read the five poems. Those were good poems. You know, I do a lot of readings, and I do a lot of readings before student poets read, and they're not all good. <laughs> that was really good. That was really good. So please give them another round of applause. <laughs> I am indeed the feature. Um, this evening, and um, I uh, will be reading from my new collection, View Us to Those Who Have Failed. Um, I'll be taking your questions, and then it'll be time for the book signing pandemonium. I think it is fitting that we're here in an old courtroom. Um, I am indeed very much at home here. Um, I, um, I was a tenant lawyer in uh, Greater Boston's Latino community, um, and both as a poet and as a lawyer, I see myself as an advocate, speaking on behalf of those without an opportunity to be heard. It's perfectly consistent. Um, and that's where I'm going to begin. Uh, I'm going to begin with a poem uh, which is an act of advocacy. Um, for those of you who have the book, those students who have it, um, this is uh, page 31 of your hymnal. And this is a poem that has uh, everything to do uh, with uh, poets as advocates and has to do with poets uh, engaging in great acts of the imagination, uh, envisioning a new world and envisioning a place that we couldn't possibly imagine right now in the midst of struggle. Um, this particular poem refers to the wave of police violence in this country against people of color. Um, some of these cases, uh, I refer to eight in all, will be familiar to you. Some of them won't because they go back 40 years. Um, I make reference to a, a, a Puerto Rican musician and photographer, Martin Tito Perez, who was a friend of my father's. It was, uh, uh, that's when I got the rude awakening. Um, so uh, it begins, however, with an epigraph from Walt Whitman, my patron saint, um, and it has everything to do with the world that poets can create. Uh, so that one day the atrocities we see all around us are absolutely unthinkable. How we could have lived or died this way. Epigraph, not songs of loyalty alone are these, but songs of insurrection also. For I am the sworn poet of every dauntless rebel the world over, Walt Whitman. 
I see the dark-skinned bodies falling in the street as their ancestors fell before the whip and steel, the last blood pooling, the last breath spitting. I see the immigrant street vendor flashing his wallet to the cops, shot so many times there are bullet holes in the soles of his feet. I see the deaf wood carver and his pocket knife crossing the street in front of a cop who yells, then fires. I see the drug raid, the wrong door kicked in the minister's heart seizing up. I see the man hawking a fistful of cigarettes, the cop's choke hold that makes his wheezing lungs stop wheezing forever. I am in the crowd, at the window, kneeling beside the body left on the asphalt for hours covered in a sheet. I see the suicide. The conga player handcuffed for drumming on the subway, hanged in the jail cell with his hands cuffed behind him. The suspect leaking blood from his chest in the back seat of the squad car. The 300-pound boy said to stampede barehanded into the bullets drilling his forehead. I see the coroner nodding, the words he types in his report burring into the skin like more bullets. I see the government investigation stacking, words buzzing on the page, then suffocated as bees suffocate in a jar. I see the next black man fleeing as a fugitive slave once fled the slave catcher, shot in the back for a broken tail light. I see the cop handcuff the corpse. I see the rebels marching. Hands up raised before the riot squads, faces in bandanas against the tear gas, and I walk beside them unseen. I see the poets who will write the songs of insurrection, generations unborn will read or hear a century from now, words that make them wonder how we could have lived or died this way, how the descendants of slaves still fled and the descendants of slave catchers still shot them, how we awoke every morning without the blood of the dead sweating from every pore. Um, there are a number of uh, poets here this evening, obviously, and uh, this next poem is about a poet, a dear friend of mine, Jose Jogogovea. Once in a while you run into a poet like this. This is a poet who loved poetry with a pure flame. It wasn't about him, it wasn't about his ego. Um, he uh, Adored poets and poetry, and he was constantly giving, giving, and giving. This is how much Joe loved poetry. It kept him alive. Um, this is on page 39. Uh, Joe indeed um, was diagnosed with cancer yet again, and he waited until his first and only book was published to finally leave this earth. Stayed alive long enough for that. And not long before he died, he asked me uh, for a favor. He asked if he could use the following poem, which I had written when his cancer came back, as the foreword for his book. And of course I said yes, it went into the book, the book came out, and then he died. Um, this is Joe, this is the poem. Here I am for Jose Jogo Gouveia, 1964 to 2014. He swaggered into the room, a poet at a gathering of poets, and the drinkers stopped crowding the cash bar, the talkers stopped their tongues, the music stopped hammering the walls, the way a saloon falls silent when a gunslinger knocks open the swinging door. Jogo, grinning in gray stubble and wraparound shades, leather Harley vest, shirt yellow as a prospector's hallucination, sleeve buttoned to hide the bandage on his arm with the IV pumped chemo through his body a few hours ago. The nurse swabbed the puncture and told him he could go, 
and Jogo would go, gunning his red van from the Cape to Boston, striding past the cops who guarded the hallways of the Grand Convention Center, as if to say, Here I am! The butcher's son, the portuguee, the roofer, the carpenter, the cab driver, the biker poet. This was Jogo, who would shout his ode to evil Knievel in biker bars till the brawlers rolled in beer and broken glass, who married Josie from Brazil on the beach after the oncologist told him he had two months to live two years ago. That's not enough for me he said, and will say again when the cancer comes back to coil around his belly and squeeze hard like a python set free and starving in the swamp. He calls me on his cell from the hospital, and I can hear him scream when they press the cold x-ray plates to his belly, but he will not drop the phone. He wants the surgery today, right now, surrounded by doctors with hands blood speckled like the hands of his father the butcher sawing through the meat for the family feast. The patient's chart should read, this is Jogo. After every crucifixion, he snaps the cross across his back for firewood. He will roll the stone from the mouth of his tomb and bowl a strike. On the night he silenced the drinkers, chewing ice in my ear, a voice in my ears said, What the hell is that man doing here? And I said, That man there, that man will live forever. We really thought that, too. Well, um... I heard a reference in that poem to uh, Jogo reading in biker bars, um, which he did. Uh, and I, in fact, the very first reading I ever did was in the bar where I was the bouncer. And uh, I have read everywhere. I did a reading once at a, a boxing gym in Willimantic for, for a team of young uh, Puerto Rican amateur boxers. Um, I did a reading once at El Matador Tortilla Factory in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, and I did a, a, a reading at the Coney Island Aquarium. And I documented that occasion in the following poem. Um, so I write a lot of poems about the power of poetry. You might say this is a poem about the powerlessness of poetry. It's on page 43, and it's called Once Thundering Penguin Herds Darken the Prairie. One, poetry for tourists. The poets bring poetry to the Coney Island Aquarium, around the corner from the wooden roller coaster creaking since 1927. Tourists staggering away queasy, yet hungry for a hot dog on the boardwalk. We will tempt them to taste the steamed tofu dog of poetry instead. <laughs> Two, poetry for jellyfish. Tonight, we declaim poems at the jellyfish exhibit. Creatures that plummet like parachutes of light, illuminated mushrooms zooming sideways, amusing themselves, oblivious to the nuances of alliteration and assonance, silently refusing to clap after the last poem. Three, poetry for penguins. The voice of a poet on a loop installed in the penguin exhibit booms out poetry in praise of penguins. Once thundering penguin herds darken the prairie, once flocks of flapping penguins blocked out the sun, now they cower behind a rock. Peeking, ducking down, listening to poetry for penguins, hearing only the rumble of the almighty orca opening his jaws on Judgment Day. Four, no poetry for the octopus or the security guard. The Coney Island Aquarium is closed. We are locked in. The octopus glares at us with one huge eye. No one fed him today. No one read him any poems. 
We panic and flap like flightless birds. We rattle the gate, wailing in chorus, We are the poets! Let us out! The security guard glares at us with one huge eye. No one fed him today. No one read him any poems. He unlocks the gate anyway. Well, um, this next poem was a request. It's from Jason. And um, oh, it's on page 45. It celebrates Howard Zinn, the historian, educator, activist, and dear friend. But it also celebrates the relationship between the teacher and the student between uh, the mentor and the protege. So it, it also celebrates the people in this room tonight. Um, this is called Castles for the Laborers of Ball Games on the Radio for Howard Zinn, 1922 to 2010. We stood together at the top of his icy steps without a word for once squinting at the hill below and the tumble we were about to take, heads bumping on every step till our bodies rolled into the street. He was older than the bread lines of the Great Depression. Before the war, he labored at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, even organized apprentices, but now there was ice. I outweighed him by a hundred pounds. When my feet began to skid, I would land on him and hear the crunch of his surgically repaired spine. The books I held for him would fly away like doves disobeying an amateur magician. Let's go back in the house, I said. Show me the baseball Sandy Koufax signed to you from one lefty to another. Instead, he picked up a blue plastic bucket of sand, the kind of pale good for building castles at Coney Island, tossed a fist of sand down onto the sun-frozen concrete and took the first step delicately. Again and again, he would throw a handful of sand in the air like bread for pigeons, then probe with the tip of his shoe for the sandy place on the next step. Sand, then step. Sand, then step. Every time he took a step, I took a step, an apprentice shadow studying the movements of his teacher, the body. This is how I came to dance a soft shoe in size 14 boots, grinding my toes into the gritty spots he left behind on the ice. I was there! I saw him turn the tundra into the beach with a wave of his hand, Coney Island of castles for the laborers of ball games on the radio, showing the way across the ice and down the hill into the street where he spoke to me the last words of the last lesson, you drive. New York section of Brooklyn. I grew up in the Linden Projects, and it was a big deal to go to Coney Island. It was an even bigger deal to go to another island, the island of Puerto Rico. That is where my father was born. That's where my roots are, my family. So um, this is a poem on page 62. Um, let's see, a little bit of vocabulary. Archaeopteryx, you know that transitional species, half dinosaur, half bird makes an appearance here. Um, there's a little bit of Spanish. Uh, I refer to the gallos de Pelé, those are the bantam roosters, the flying cocks. Um, the Dia de Reyes is Three Kings Day, January 6th, 12th day of Epiphany. Um, so, the discovery of Archaeopteryx. My grandfather's hands raised the rooster up for all the boys to see. 
I was a Brooklyn boy, lost in the Puerto Rico of my grandfather. Car sick from backseat journeys through the mountains that dipped and rolled like a green serpent undulating through the sea. I had never seen a rooster. Once, I saw a cow in a pen at Beachcomber Bills on Coney Island and climbed the rail to stroke the huge head between the eyes. My shirt tails hung out and the cow began to chew the cloth. The cow kept chewing till my father yanked me by the arm. At last, Puerto Rico stopped dipping and rolling through the sea. Here was Archaeopteryx, the feathered reptile, the dinosaur bird, the fossil made flesh risen screeching from the rock. I was dumbstruck by the blackness of the tail, the beak and spurs that kept my fingers away. My grandfather's hand calmed the ticking of the rooster's heart, the same brown hands that beckoned me with blessings in Spanish at Christmas. My first word was hat, and my grandfather's straw fedora was the first hat, the same hat shading his eyes the day he showed me the first rooster. As a boy, my father learned about roosters. He saw my grandfather guide the bird into the pit. The wagers change hands, the gallos de pelea whirl and slash the eyes till a blinded rooster bled into the sand. My father ran where no one could see, spat up yesterday's rice and beans. My grandfather's winnings paid for the rice and beans, the straw fedora, the baseball glove, and a box left behind by the kings on the Dia de Reyes. A Brooklyn boy, I knew nothing of roosters, how the spurs of game cocks cut throats for sport, how a hammer strikes a cow between the eyes. I was a big and hungry boy who only knew the taste of flesh was two more. Um, as uh, Jason mentioned, um, the last section of this book consists of a series of poems about my father, Francisco Luis Espada, Frank Espada, who was born in 1930 in Puerto Rico and who died in 2014 uh, in San Francisco. And um, by the way, uh, Jason, thank you for accurately summarizing my father's life. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, NBC Latino screwed it up something fierce. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, I'm going to read two of those ten poems. Um, if, if you know this, if you've ever lost a parent, uh, this is a poem on page 69. If you've ever lost a parent, uh, you've been through this where you're, you're sifting through all the stuff all the garbage, all the trash, and, and you know, you wonder, why did he keep this? Why did he keep that? What is this doing here? What does it mean? And then you find that jewel. You find that shimmering jewel in the trash. Uh, and it's a jewel to me, if to no one else. Uh, again, a bit of Spanish in this poem, um, Noche Buena, of course, Christmas uh, Eve. Um, I make uh, reference to uh, a very common Puerto Rican expression, bandito, which literally means blessed one, but has about a hundred different shades of meaning uh, on the island. Um, so uh, here it is, uh, and it, it also references the experience of visiting Puerto Rico for the first time when I was 11. Uh, it's called Haunt Me for My Father. I am the archaeologist. I sift the shards of you. Cufflinks, passport photos, a button from the March on Washington with a black hand shaking a white hand, letters in Spanish, your birth certificate from a town high in the mountains. I cup your silence, and the silence melts like ice in a cup. I search for you in two yellow Kodak boxes marked Puerto Rico, Noche Buena, December 1968. In the eight-millimeter silence, the espadas 
gather, elders born before the Spanish-American War, my grandfather on crutches after fracturing his fossil hip, his blind brother on a cane. You greet the elders and they call you Tato, the name they call you there. Uncles and cousins sing in a chorus of tongues without sound, vibration of guitar strings stilled by an unseen hand, maraca shaking empty of seats. The camera wobbles from the singers to the television and the astronauts sending pictures of the moon back to Earth. Down by the river, women still pound laundry on the rocks. I am eleven again. A boy from the faraway city of ice that fell to my grandfather, startled after the blind man with the king, stroked my face with his hand dry as straw, crying out, Bendito! At the table, I hear only the silence that rises like the river in my big ears. You sit next to me, clowning for the camera, tugging the lapels on your jacket, slicking back your black hair, brown skin darker from days in the sun. You slide your arm around my shoulder, your good right arm, your pitching arm, and my moon face radiates, and the mountain song of my uncles and cousins plays in my head. Watching you now, my face stings as it stung when my blind great-uncle brushed my cheekbone searching for his own face. When you died, Tato, I took a razor to the movie looping in my head, cutting the scenes where you curled an arm around my shoulder. All the times you would squeeze the silence out of me so I could hear the cries and songs again. When you died, I heard only the silences between us, the shouts belling the air before the phone went dead, all the words melting like ice in a cup. That way, I could set my jaw and take my mother's hand at the mortuary, greet the elders in my suit and tie at the memorial, say all the right words. Yet, my face stings at last. I rewind. Now watch your arm drape across my shoulder, over and over. A year ago, you pressed a Kodak slide of my grandfather into my hand and said, next time, stay longer. Now, in the silence that is never silent, I push the chair away from the table and say to you, sit down, tell me everything. Haunt me. Um, and this is the last poem I'll read tonight. And then uh, glad to take your questions about anything I've read, anything in the book, anything about uh, poetry, the poetic process. Um, this is the last poem in the book. It's uh, also the poem I read at my father's memorial service in Brooklyn, page 84. Um, as Jason mentioned, my father uh, was, uh, well, many things. He was indeed um, a community organizer, a civil rights activist. He was a leader, many people would say the leader of the Puerto Rican community in New York City in the 1960s and early 1970s. And he was, above all, a documentary photographer, the founder and director of the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, the photo documentary and oral history of the Puerto Rican migration. So he was larger than life. He was like a Puerto Rican Paul Bunyan. And what do you do with that life when the man dies? How do you sum it up? Those many lives, those many deaths, those many rebirths, well, this is my attempt to do so. And the metaphor I chose was the metaphor uh, of a tiny plant. A plant that grows in Puerto Rico is called the Morivivi. Now, Morivivi, the Puerto Rican Spanish, literally translates to, I died, I lived. And it's one of those plants where it, 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 if you touch it, it shrinks, and then it opens again. And in the darkness, it closes. 
and the light it opens again. So there it was, my metaphor for the many lives, the deaths, and the rebirths, and the ultimate rebirth of Frank Espada, because he's here now. So, um, this is the poem. El Moribibi in Memoriam Frank Espada, 1930 to 2014, and I'll finish with this. The Spanish means I died, I lived. In Puerto Rico, the leaves of El Moribibi close in the dark and open at first light. The fronds curl at a finger's touch and then unfurl again. My father, a mountain born of mountains, the tallest Puerto Rican in New York, who scraped doorways, who could crack the walls with the rumble of his voice, kept the moribibi growing in his ribs. He would die, then live. My father spoke in the tongue of El Moribibi, teaching me the parable of Joe Fleming who screwed his lit cigarette into the arms of the spicks he caught flapping like fish. My father was a bony boy, the nerves in his back crushed by the ILO Coal and Ice Company, the load he lifted up too many flights of stairs. Three times they would meet to brawl for a crowd after school. The first time my father opened his eyes to gravel in the shoes of his enemy. The second time he rose and dug his arm up to the elbow in the monster's belly so badly did he want to tear out the heart and eat it. The third time Fleming did not show up. And the boys with cigarette burns clapped the spindly champion on the back all the way down the street. Fleming would become a cop, fired for breaking bones in too many faces. He died smoking in bed, a sheet of flame up to his chin. There was a moribibi sprouting in my father's chest. He would die, then live. He spat obscenities like sunflower seeds at the driver who told him to sit at the back of the bus in Mississippi, then slipped his cap over his eyes and fell asleep. He spent a week in jail, called it the best week of his life, strode to the jailhouse door and sat behind the driver of the bus on the way out of town, his Air Force uniform, all that kept the noose from his neck. He would come to know the jailhouse again among hundreds of demonstrators ferried by police to Hart Island on the East River where the city of New York stacks the coffins of anonymous and stillborn bodies. Here, Confederate prisoners once wept for the stars and bars. Now, the prisoners sang freedom songs. The jailers outlawed phone calls, so we were sure my father must be a body like the bodies rolling waterlogged in the East River till he came back from the island of the dead, black hair combed meticulously. When the riots burned in Brooklyn night, night. My father was a peacemaker on the corner with a megaphone. A fiery chunk of concrete fell from the sky and missed his head by inches. My mother would tell me, your father is out dodging bullets. He spoke at a rally with Malcolm X, incantatory words billowing through the bundled crowd, lifting hands and faces. Teach! They cried. My father clicked a photograph of Malcolm as he bent to hear a question finger pressed against the chin. Two months later, the assassin stampeded the crowd to shoot Malcolm, blood leaping from his chest as he fell. My father would die too, but then he would live again. After every riot, every rally, every arrest, every night in jail, the change from his pockets landing hard on the dresser at 4 a.m. every time I swore he was gone for good. My father knew the secrets of El Moribibi, that he would die, then live. He drifted off at the wheel, drove into a guardrail, shook his head, and walked away without a web of scars or fractures. He passed out from the heat in the subway, toppled onto the tracks, and somehow missed the third rail. 
He tied a white apron across his waist to open a grocery store, pulled a revolver from the counter to startle the gangsters demanding protection, then put up signs for a clearance sale as soon as they backed out the door with their hands in the air. When the family finally took a vacation in the mountains of the Hudson Valley, a hotel with waiters and white jackets and white paint peeling in the room, the roof exploded in flame as if the ghost of Joe Fleming and his cigarette trailed us everywhere. And it was then that my father appeared in the smoke like a general leading the charge in battle, shouting commands at the volunteer fire company, steering the water from the hotel since he was immune to death by fire or water, as if he wore the crumbled leaves of El Morigui in an amulet slung around his neck. My brother called to say El Morigui was gone. My father tore at the wires, the electrodes, the IV, saying that he wanted to go home. The hospital was a jailhouse in Mississippi. The furious pulse that fired his heart in every fight flooded the chambers of his heart. The doctors scrutinized the film, the grainy shadows and the light, but could never see. My father was a morivivi. I died, I lived, he died, he lived, he dies, he lives. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, but it's, I think it's a pretty striking like a vocal register that changes when you start reading. It's, it's almost like that in my olive voice that I was you know, talking about earlier, but it's a pretty incredible uh, presence. A little bit like Tom Waits, I don't know if you like Tom Waits, <laughs> it was sort of a uh, persona that you go into. And I was wondering, uh, for the students, many of whom are just performing their poems for the first time, if you could talk about maybe the process when you were younger, like, was that just something you did in the very beginning? Did you develop that over time? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, maybe the other guy is the persona. <laughs> the one you just heard is really me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a funny thing about that. Which one is the real one? Maybe they're all the real guy, right? Um, and long before I ever did a uh, public reading of poetry, um, I was on radio. And um, I, I did uh, news, public affairs, music um, for um, a radio station called WRTFM in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, 89.7 on your FM dial. Uh, <laughs> listener sponsored radio. Um, it was similar to NPR, but not NPR, community radio. And there is a big difference. But um, I, you know, I did everything there was to do, and so um, I learned how to um, I learned how to use a microphone. You know, um, so if you hear any remnants of a radio persona, uh, radio presence, uh, uh, that's that literally predates the poetry. Um, as far as the rest of it goes, um, as I mentioned uh, during the reading, I've read in every possible. Uh, venue you could possibly imagine, you know, um, and there are some places I've read where you had to do certain things to get, you know, to get people to focus. Uh, and so, um, you know, the the readings in 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 bars, uh, you know, nowadays the, the public readings are so commonplace and they're so commonplace in bars or uh, uh, cafes so on and so forth. You know, I think I did my first public reading in a bar in 1979. You know, where it was quite, a, it was not something expected, you know. So in order to make yourself heard, you had to grab the audience by the throat. 
Um, and, you know, I was used to doing that anyway, as a bouncer. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, with every generation, the, the, uh, the styles of performance and the needs of performance change. Uh, I can remember talking to a poet by the name of Clemente Sotoveles, a Puerto Rican poet who was also um, a, uh, a, 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 a leader of the independence movement in Puerto Rico. And when I would hear this guy project, he was about five foot six, and when I knew him, he already had white hair all the way down his back and his sort of white mustache. I mean, he was, and he would shake his fist and he could be heard without a microphone down the street. And I asked him once where he got that from. You see, you have to remember the rallies I was speaking at in the 1930s, there were no microphones. There was no projection whatsoever. And we had to speak to thousands of people, the four or five blocks. We had to be able to make ourselves understood, you know. So, I don't know uh, if, you know, you do, you do what it takes to communicate with an audience, but above all, um, everything that you hear in my voice is already in the poems. It's already there, right? I am, I am not reading, um, you know, I'm not reading poems about uh, my, my vacation in Paris, you know? Uh, the last poem that I read to you has to be read that way, all right? Um, because it's about my father's life and death, and every time I read it, it tears me in half. So the only way I can get through it is to read it the way I just read it. So it's not, it's not that I'm, you know, I'm not turning into Tom Waits up here. That's what I have to do in order to get through the poem emotionally. That's what the language and emotions of the poem require me to do. So when you're sitting down to write a poem, do you generally have an idea of where it's going, that like the sort of outline, or do you kind of just let the pen go and write what you feel? Well, many of the poems I write are narrative poems, obviously. Um, so I have a, a pretty good idea of where I'm going. I just don't know how I'm going to get there. And there will be times when I start with the end and work my way back. Um, there are times when the last line of the poem will occur to me first. Um, there are times when I, I, I've told the story so many times that it's a matter of taking a certain kind of dictation. But um, of course, one of the things that differentiates the language on the page from the language of a, a story I would tell among friends is that I am, uh, I want to ground the poem in um, the language of the image, in the senses, um, so that you can see or hear what I see or hear, and therefore hopefully you can feel what I feel. Yes. So, when you uh, write a poem, when do you decide that it's done? When do I decide it's done? Oh, um, you know, I can remember asking uh, a, a poet named Jim Stevens the same question when I was first starting out. I said, How do you know when it's done? And Jim said, when I have it in its least objectionable form. <laughs> and he talked like that because he was on the radio. Um, it is uh, always, um, it's always a very subjective thing. Uh, and there are times when I am sure it's done and then I wake up the next morning and I know it's not done. And I've done this enough times so that I'm aware of that process and I'm aware of being a little too sure of myself and saying, aha, it's over now. And sometimes there's so much relief just having told the story or having gotten difficult emotions out into the world that you, you desperately want it to be done. And then you wake up the next day, you know, I'll wake up at 7 in the morning and say, ah, oh, God damn it. <laughs> and I start again. And one thing I'll say is, in as much as I know, again, what I want to say, I am very, very tough on myself when it comes on the, lang uh, the language I choose to say it. And I am not sentimental about my language. Right? I am willing to, t 
tear the whole thing up and start over again. Um, and I've done that before. As long as I'm heading where, I, where it is I ultimately want to go and, and telling the tale I want to tell, in the emotional register I want to tell it, I'm not married to the words. You know, and I'll come back, I'm looking not just for a good word or a better word, but the best word. Again, subjective judgment, though that may be. Question? Yeah, um, just sort of going back to you, I know you mentioned, and it's obvious from your work that you're a very narrative type of writer. Um, I was just curious if that sort of stemmed from, I mean, your father was in a photo documentarian, and even now mentioning that you worked in radio, was that sort of a motivation as to how you're process and how your poetry sort of came out as more of a narrative type of process. Motivation? Um, could you say more about that? What do you have in mind? Um, I mean, I guess just when, I guess when you were starting off as a writer and you thought, okay, I want to start writing poetry, was like your father having had a big influence on that or you were working radio or anything? No, I mean, I understand. Um, my father, uh, my father completed high school. My mother completed high school. I was the first person in my family to go to college. So they didn't have any awareness of poetry, per se. They certainly were not aware that you uh, could do that and, and make a living. Um, and so uh, poetry was not on their radar, with one exception. My father, when I was 17 years old, gave me a copy of the Rubiata of Omar Khayyam, along with a Playboy calendar. <laughs> You know, I was 17, I was a mystery to my father, as 17-year-olds tend to be, and he was throwing everything at me to see what would stick. You know, the Rubiat, Playboy. And the Rubiat stuck. <laughs> you know, which I'm sure came as a shock to him. But that was the only book of poetry he knew. You know, because everybody got that book at a certain time. Uh, you know, he went to high school in the 1940s. Everybody got that book. Everybody knew that book. Um, but, um, you know, there was no other deeper understanding of what I was trying to do as a poet. In fact, I was, in some ways, discouraged. Because when I got my bachelor's degree, um, I was thinking about, you know, going to the next level as a poet. And my parents had no idea what I was talking about, and neither did I. You know, I had never heard of an MFA. Me, I mean, my parents, I mean, my mother once pulled me aside and said, hey, answer me something. She says, what's a graduate student? I thought once you graduate, you're not a student anymore. You know, and you know, recently when I sent my mother this book, she read it very carefully twice. And she called me and she said, I have to ask you about one of these poems. Is this a poem or an essay? And what I figured out, the question she was asking, what she was getting at is, what is a narrative poem? Can a poem tell a story? And once I sorted that out, I said, yeah, this is, this is called a narrative poem, and it is a poem, yeah. Um, but that's how far removed she was from what we think of as poetry or a literary education. And that's, and my, my father was equally far removed. Now, uh, what I did carry over from my father was this passion uh, for justice. Um, and, you know, he, was, he had a way with words himself as you might imagine, you know, and he would stand up there and thunder, you know, without a microphone, so maybe I got some of it from him too. But um, the reality is they, I was taking this to a place that, you know, they had never heard of, and in part because I, uh, due to their efforts, due to their labors, uh, was able to get an education that they never would have dreamed of themselves, you know, and you know, sometimes they liked what I did as a poet, sometimes they didn't like it, you know. And by the way, you know, I, I know those, some of you are thinking, well, you know, I'm going to be writing poems about my family. What do I do? And I would urge you to avoid what I call the report card reflex, which is to say you don't have to show everything to your parents. Okay? Um, there are, there, are, there are some things they, they probably would like to see and some things they wouldn't like to see. And, and I was doing this with, with my parents into my mid-30s. And a poet friend of mine, Gary Soto, he posed the question to me, he said, look, Martina, let me ask you something. 
If you publish this poem in a book, and the book is in a bookstore, would your parents go into that bookstore, see the book and buy it? I said, well, no, I mean, they, they wouldn't go into a bookstore. So they wouldn't see the book or buy it. And he said, so what's the problem? <laughs> you know, um, because ultimately, even though I write about the family and I often write about the family in laudatory terms, I also write about the family in very critical terms. I say things about uh, my father, I say things about other people in my family they would not like to have heard. You, you're not a press agent for the family. Now, you're not writing for the family, the immediate family. You're writing for the human family and that shared human experience. One more. Yes. So, one of the things that I love is that you can do very long lines and the enjambments seem to flow naturally. Uh, do you have any tips for working with enjambments? Is it something that you do consciously, selecting the words for the enjambments, or do you just kind of let it flow? Well, um, enjambment, I'm tempted to say it goes good on toast. <laughs> Um, yeah, it flows, but I'm also very conscious of every line. And it has to break naturally for me, or it won't work. Um, so, um, I, and I must admit, I, I, you know, when I look at this, I think not only in terms of enjambment, not only in terms of line breaks, but also in terms of things like punctuation. Punctuation is your friend. You know, and, and oftentimes poets don't punctuate, not because they're making a statement uh, aesthetically, but because they don't know how to punctuate. And they think, well, I can get away with it because it's poetry. I mean, come on, help the reader if you can. Um, and I was gifted, I was blessed with a proofreader who teaches uh, uh, what's called developmental studies, who teaches people how to read and write teaches the illiterate. How's that for a miracle? And she proofread, and she kept finding all the commas and all the semicolons and all the things I either had missed or misused at my advanced age. So I think very carefully about these things, of course. Um, the other thing I should say is in terms of responding to your question is that I, um, I read the poems out loud as I write them. So I'm listening for those rhythms, and I'm looking at those rhythms on the page, and if it doesn't make sense rhythmically, I'm not talking about, you know, formal scansion or meter, but if it doesn't make sense rhythmically, I'm not going to break it. Uh, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna break a line with the word the at the end of it. You know, that's just, my God, is that awkward. <laughs> and that would make me crazy. And what makes me even crazier is if you see this square, okay, this is, all right. The, the book business. That book is square, right? It's virtually square. It's a funny shape, isn't it? There's a reason for that. Because the lines are so damn long that rather than fight with me over it, they decided to configure the shape of the book in such a way that the lines wouldn't run over, okay? And, and create what are called wraparounds. Um, and sometimes the worst of that is when there's like one line, one word hanging off, okay, um, you know, just one line dangling by itself. Help! <laughs> we call those widows and orphans. Now, you don't want any widows and orphans, you know. So rather than go to the mat with me on this, because, you know, my publisher and I have been rolling around for years, and she, they don't want to do that with me. Why would you want to fight with a lawyer? <laughs> So, she, she thinks they came up with this, brilliant, make it a square, everybody's happy, you know. Then to, fit, then to fit all the words in, then to fit all the words in, I have to tell you this because this made me angry, um, they, they shrunk the notes on the poems down to like a six point font. So you needed a magnifying glass and you were in danger of setting the paper on fire. And I had to fight with them about that, and you know, this is a blank, page to one side of the notes, is a blank page to the other side of the notes, use the blank pages! Because people who design books love blank pages, whereas poets love pages with words on them. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I finally persuaded them of the wisdom of my ways. And it goes back to those damn long lines. 
And there are times when I've written all over my page proofs, when I see my lines destroyed, what would Whitman do? <laughs> because he had those long lines. And you better believe he respected the integrity of that long line, the power, the galloping power you can put into the rhythm of a long line. Right? That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for, that's what I want. Right? And if I can do my father proud and I can do Walt Whitman proud at the same time, then why not?